cars head north to begin the second half of the season at the CART Toronto Indy. The Canadian city of Toronto on the shores of Lake Ontario. A progressive metropolis, proud of their traditions, playing host to Prince Andrew and Fergie on a royal visit to Canada. And the recent addition to the downtown, the new Sky Dome, home of the Toronto Blue Jays. The Canadians have also welcomed a former Toronto Indy winner, Emerson Fittipaldi, who continues his domination with a pole here. His quest for the kart championship began this May when he became only the fourth Formula One champion to win the Indianapolis 500. Three weeks later, he won the first of three consecutive races, starting at the Detroit Grand Prix. It was the beginning of a sensational season for co-owner Pat Patrick and the Patrick Racing Team. Portland followed with a ride to victory lane by Bobby Rahal after running out of fuel at the checkered flag. At Cleveland, he won his third consecutive race. At the Meadowlands, he challenged Bobby Rahal for the lead, but finished second in a rain-shortened race. Bad weather didn't dampen his spirits. As he was pleased with the finish, he continues his march for the title. Emerson sits on the pole for the second week in a row and goes for his fifth victory in nine starts. He leads the point standings with 125 points, and he has earned a record $1,454,000 to date. This is Charlie Jones and Johnny Rutherford. And Johnny, Emerson Fittipaldi having an unbelievable year. What is it like from a driver's standpoint? Oh, I can tell you it is a wonderful sensation. I had a year like that in 1980, Charlie. The car allows you to do things that you wouldn't be able to do normally. If you have a chance on the racetrack to pass somebody, but it's a little bit of a squeaker, then you don't take the chance. You wait until you get a clean shot at them. If your pit crew makes a pit stop a little bit long, you know you can just squeeze the car a little bit harder and you'll make up the difference. It's a great feeling. All right, who can chase Emerson Fittipaldi today? Well, I think my one, number one pick is Michael Andretti. Michael has led every race this season but one, and he's had some rotten luck. So I really think it's time for Michael to come to the front and win one. Who's your second choice? Well, I think Danny Sullivan has proven himself here in qualifying. You know, he's been nursing that broken arm. He's done well. He's always done well at this racetrack. So I think Danny is back. Mm -hmm. What about the cast? Is he wearing a cast? Yes, he has a. He doesn't have a cast. He has a brace on his right arm, and he's getting more accustomed to that. And his arm's healing, so he's uh, he's going to be ready. Who's your third choice? Well, I think obviously it's the guy that's starting in the front row. Uh, Al Unser Jr. is starting with Emerson Fittipaldi, and these guys have developed a magnetic personality for one another. And I'm telling you, they come together a lot, as we've seen in the last two years. The situation being, Al Unser is young, aggressive. He's starting up there. He'll be a factor. All right, they're side by side, first row. Who's going to win the race to the first turn? Well, I think age difference is going to show up here, Charlie. We're looking at Al Unser, who is young, aggressive. He will try to assert himself and push himself into the first turn. So I think he might be the winner of that race. But Emerson Fittipaldi has got the age and the experience, and he knows you don't have to lead that first turn to win the race. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Now, Charlie, it's a unique opportunity when you see the winners of this race the last two years side by side, as you mentioned, in the front row. Over here on the pole, of course, Emerson Fittipaldi enjoying such a brilliant season, leading the points chase. He starts here from the pole position, having won here two years ago. But right next door to him is the man who won this race last year, Al Unser Jr. Now, this may be the closest that these cars have been to each other physically since that memorable late lap at May at Indianapolis at 220 miles per hour. Little Al into the wall and Emerson on to the victory. But little Al Unser now starts in the front row for the third time this year. He's won on the streets at Long Beach. He was second at Indianapolis despite the crash. He was second at Phoenix. He's third in championship points. And while he trails Emerson by 47, he still honestly believes that he can catch Fittipaldi for the championship. But he knows if that's to be the case, he has got to win here where he won a year ago. Now, as the engines get started, let's check back into the next row, Sally Larbig. Only five thousandths of a second separating the qualifying speed of Ellis Jr. and Danny Sullivan. Sullivan wants to do well at this race as he has in the past, finishing second three times in a row. But he wants to do more than that. He wants to win it. He wants to prove that the arm that he broke at Indianapolis is now completely healed and is not a factor in his driving. He had some x-rays taken yesterday, and the boat has completely healed together. He is competitive. He wants to win. As a matter of fact, he said that this is the first race in Phoenix that he feels more like a driver than a patient. Now let's go back up to the booth and Charlie Jones. All right.
right, thank you, Gary, and thank you, Sally. And the weather here, well, the temperature is in the low 90s. It is humid, it is very warm, and another great crowd on hand here for the fourth Toronto Indy. And Johnny Rutherford, let's take a look at the course they'll be driving. All right, we'll go for a lap now with Al Unser Jr. around this Toronto race course. Here we are in the Princess Gate corner, which is a very tight right-hander. It continues to be a right-hand sweeper. And out onto the back straightaway, the Lakeshore Drive, the Lakeshore Straight. It's very quick here. You're up into fifth or sixth gear, depending on which gearbox you're using. Running about 180 miles an hour, heading for the Lakeshore hairpin. This is a very tight right-hand decreasing radius corner, uphill a bit. You have to get a lot of power down, get the car going for this short straightaway, heading for the stadium turn. Now, there's a lot of concrete around here, so you really have to thread the needle into the sweeper, which is very quick, through the gears. Once again, into top gear, heading down toward the S's. There's a little kink here you have to get through, and you go through that flat out very fast right there, downshifting, heartbreaking into a 90-degree right-hand corner, starting through the S's. Once again, a lot of concrete here. You probably make about 15 or 18 shifts around this race course, so you stay quite busy. Headed into the exhibition curve and across the start-finish line for one lap of the Toronto Indy Track. And now the butterflies begin as the cars are on the racetrack. Let's take a look at the starting grid. Row one, Emerson Fittipaldi, the hottest driver this year, and he won here two years ago. And Al Unser Jr., the defending champion here at Toronto. In row two, Danny Sullivan, the defending national champion. And Bobby Rahal, who won here in 1986. Row three, Michael Andretti still looking for his first IndyCar victory. They owe Fabi a dark horse. He could win today for Porsche. Row four, Mario Andretti, 21 career cart wins on road courses. And Rick Mears, don't forget him. He's second in championship point standing. Row five, Ari Leyendijk, who runs well on the road courses. And Derek Daly, consistently, he has been a top qualifier. Row six, Scott Pruitt, he finished second at Detroit. Royal Boisel, who finished third in the Indy 500. And row seven, Fabrizio Barbaza. Oh, what a great name. His nickname, by the way, is Turtle, and he has a tortoise, tortoise shell painted on his helmet. Outside row seven, Scott Goodyear, hometown favorite from Toronto. Row eight, John Jones, another Canadian favorite. He's from Thunder Bay, Ontario. And Randy Lewis, and he has a problem with the wall here. Hit it in practice, hit it here a year ago. Row nine, Dominic Dobson, cart rookie of the year in 1986. And Jan Bikas, who is making his IndyCar debut today. Row 10, Roberto Guerrero, twice he has been second in the Indy 500. And Scott Brayton, 10th last week at the Meadowlands. In row 11, Kevin Kogan last year, he hit the wall here and broke his left forearm. And Pancho Carter, this is his 145th IndyCar start. Row 12, John Andretti. This is the son of Aldo, Mario's twin brother. And Ludwig Heimrath, the third Canadian in the field. Row 13, Bernard Jourdain. He finished ninth in the Indy 500. Guido Daco in his sixth IndyCar start. Row 14, Steve Celine, designer and manufacturer of the Celine Mustang. And outside row 14, A.J. Foyt, last year, he was voted Kart's most improved driver. And, get him out there. <laughs> and we'll be back with the green flag in just a moment. <laughs> This NBC Sports special presentation of the Toronto Indy is brought to you by Budweiser. Beats with age for that. Welcome back to the Toronto Indy. And we are just moments away from the green flag. Let's go down to Gary Gerald here. Charlie, while we await the start of this race, here's a driver ready to go, but he can't get in his car. It's Derek Daly. They had a fuel leak. This one could have been a potentially dangerous situation for you. Will you get the race? I'm not sure. They're working on the car right now. On the grid, when Valvoline topped the tank right at to the top, 
it began to leak out the top, but it went down the back of the seat and down into the area where I sit. So it's an impossible situation which they're trying to rectify right now. Derek Daly can only hope that he gets a chance to race here momentarily on the streets of Toronto, Charlie. And also, Gary, John Jones had a problem in the pit, and he just went out car number 65. We have three car cams, and Johnny Rutherford, this is the look from the car of Alan Sir Jr. Little Al. Yes, these things are terrific. They give you a real view of what it looks like out there to be running. And there you see Emerson Fittipoli. They're sweeping their cars, trying to clean them off and get a little heat into them. And then we have a car cam in the car of Bob Rahal. And then a little further back in the car of Ludwig Heinrich. You should get some great pictures of these cars. Those add to the cover. Oh, it does. All right, John, what are your keys to the right? Well, I think, obviously, it's it's keeping it away from the wall. Well, you had to think for a while, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> now you can tell. Yes. All right. Keeping it away from the fence, obviously, because that'll tear up your car and put you out. you got to protect the gearbox. You know, you, you've still got to feel those gears in, make sure they're working right. And now the race to the green flag, and then the race to Princess Kate. And the green flag is out, and it is Emerson Fittipaldi jumping out in front. Look at the front tires locked up on Michael as he makes a move up into the front there. Emerson Fittipaldi took the lead, and was that Danny Sullivan that went right with him, I believe? He sure did. I'll tell you what, that was something. I figured Al Unser would be a little bit stronger than that, but obviously something happened, or he decided to lay back and take it easy until it counted. Is that a good strategy? Well, it, it can be, very much so, because he's able to run with the front uh, runners uh, any time he wants to there, so he'll, he'll just sit and watch and see how strong they are. How important is the first lap? Well, obviously, uh, you just want to get you a spot. On a road course, it's very hard to pass, so you want to try to get the best spot you can in that first turn without jeopardizing your situation. It is Emerson Fittipaldi with the early lead, and then Danny Sullivan went with him. Michael Andretti is there, and then we had little Al starting off in fourth place. Are you surprised by that, by the uh, turn of events, because you thought Al would be right up there at the I top? I really did. I honestly thought that he would push out to the front and, and uh, not to be uh, led that first lap as they come by the start-finish line to complete it. Emmo is just sitting out there in uh, that position where he can run and do whatever he wants to. That's really uh, that's a great feeling. So it is Emerson Fittipaldi in first, followed by Danny Sullivan, Michael Andretti, Little Al Unser, Bobby Rahal, and then Teo Fabi. They are the top six. And then we have, uh, is Mario Andretti in seventh? We have that unofficially. Danny Sullivan is really pressing Mario. I mean, uh, Emmo, look at there. He's right tight up against him. They distance uh, Michael Andretti just a little bit as they accelerate off the turn. So, you know, it's, uh, Danny is racing. He looks like he is ready. Well, he's been, he said that this is the most comfortable that he has been since he broke his arm. Yes, that's quite obvious. And he qualified well, and now he's running second, uh, giving uh, Emerson all he wants. And now let's go down to Sally Larder. Something kind of interesting about Danny Sullivan's car, this is not the car that he drove at the Meadowlands. This is actually the very first PC-18 that was made. It was used for developmental purposes. It was run in Indianapolis. Danny's original car has been sent to England for an overhaul. They feel that this is the best car that they could give Danny to win this race, and so far it may work out for them, Charlie. All right, here are the standings. It is Emerson Fittipaldi, Danny Sullivan, Michael Andretti, Al Unser Jr., Little Al, Bobby Rahal, Teo Fabi, Mario Andretti, and Rick Mears, they are the top eight. Ari Leyendijk is running ninth, and unofficially have Scott Pruitt running 10. Yeah, here we have a shot uh, over Al Unser's shoulder. He's running right tight up against Michael. He's giving Michael all he wants, and there's a little bit of space. So this is, a, this is the second group. Al Unser Jr. is fourth, so out in front of him, and from the car cam, you see directly in front of Michael Andretti, then Danny Sullivan, and then Emerson Fittipaldi. This is a real tight front pack. They are sitting there, I'm sure, just kind of feeling things out, getting tires warmed up, getting the car, getting the rhythm of things, and then they'll make their start making moves. So it'll be interesting to watch Michael. I think he's due. I think he's ready to start closing up, although he's got a little space there. And here comes Danny Sullivan and Sullivan trying to get underneath uh, Fittipaldi, oh. and he cuts him up as he goes through Princess Gate. That was close, you know, and Danny knew what he was doing. Uh, thank goodness for Emmo, because Emmo didn't give him any room, and Danny had to pull back out of it. 
And now they go down Lakeshore straight. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, Charlie, this is an amplification on the point that Sally made relating to Danny Sullivan. Sullivan doesn't have the same car he drove a week ago. Neither does Emerson Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi last week qualified the backup car. They had a motor mount problem, a mechanical chassis problem, they called it, that they uh, corrected. They went with the backup car. He finished second in that race. The car he's in today would have been the primary car last weekend. This is the car that he won at Indianapolis in. Amazing from a super speed where you run 220 miles per hour to a street course. Same machine out in front. There we saw car 21 Roberto coasting Guerrero. in the yep. Alfa Romeo. Uh, he's obviously got a serious problem pulling out of the way. And it is still Emerson Fittipaldi, and he is being stalked by Danny Sullivan. And Sullivan again moves in underneath him, and Danny oh, Sullivan takes the lead as the he pass. goes through Princess Gate. What a classic. That was just like you read it in the book. That's the way to do it. Now he set him up on that same turn, the last lap. This is interesting. Here we see Roberto is pulled off, and uh, they have the caution flags waving. And Roberto was in 18th position when he had his problems and came off to the side of the track. You know, it appears that Danny Sullivan is pulling away from Emerson. So there are two PC-18s, and uh, I think Danny is getting a little revenge for the Penske team. The top four, Emerson Fittipaldi, Danny Sullivan, Michael Andretti, and little Al Unser. And they seem to have some, some space between the rest of the field, and here is the pass. Oh, that's classic. He just outbraked him into that turn, got in just right. The car held for him. Slipped right in just like it was uh, an everyday drive. We talk about setting him up. Now, how do you set up the man in front of you so you can pass on a road course? Well, you watch to see if you got you have a, a condition where you can outbreak him or break a little bit later to be able to get the position on him. And that's just what Danny did. He outbraked him into that turn, was in the right place to take him over when they made the turn. Came in the position. And again, the top four, as you see, are Sullivan, Fittipaldi, Michael Andretti, and little Al Unser. Then it is Bobby Rahal, Teo Fabi, Mario Andretti, Rick Mears, Ari Leyendijk, Scott Pruitt at the top ten. Starting the second ten is Boisel, Barbaza, Scott Goodyear, Randy Lewis, John Jones, Kevin Kogan, Dominic Dobson, Vikas, and Ludwig Heimrath. So that'll give you a run of who you, where your favorite driver might be located. This is early, of course, in the race. A total of 103 laps, 183 miles, or 300 kilometers. 11 turns, 7 right, and 4 left. Well, Al Unser is giving uh, Michael Andretti all he wants. They are very, very close. Al is probably looking for that one weakness that he can use to get by Michael Andretti. What do you look for when you look for that weakness? Where are you trying to pick him up? Well, you know, breaking, you know, breaking into the turn. See if he's a little bit wide in the spot so you can have the position to get down inside of him. Once you get inside of him, you take him over. Certain drivers you have to be cautious of, though, because they uh, don't sometimes and it can uh, cause a tie as a driver that's just a local yellow there because of the car Roberto Guerrero now as a driver are you always aware who is behind you and where they are and what they like to do you have to be Charlie you, you just no way that you cannot know where they are or what's happening around you because it's it's key to any move you make and uh, if you make the wrong moves and you've crashed you've had a problem we got a car in the pits that is Randy Lewis I believe yes, yes he is in the pits he's had his problems here into the wall in practice yesterday a year ago in practice he went in the wall and in the race last year he went into the wall Danny Sullivan is leading the Toronto Indy Welcome back to the oh! Toronto Indy, and we got back oh, just in Oh, the no, Mario. Mario oh, trying to get inside of Teo Fabi. And he hit the car, Roberto Guerrero. Did he just forget that the car was there? I don't know. It, for a while? it looked like he was blind, was behind Teo, and he pulled out behind him to go by, and bang, there was the car of Roberto Guerrero. What an unfortunate thing for Mario. I hope he's not hurt. Look here. He pulls over. Look, it's there. He has no chance to come back. He tries. It's too late. Takes the left side off of Guerrero's, the right side off of his. And now I think he collects. He collects Teo right here because it, you can see the car come in in the, the front of it, I believe, as he sliding the tires. They're locked up. No, obviously he didn't. He just hit the end of the tires there, the end of the wall, down into a barrier. There's the front of another car. I don't know who that was. But you can see he slides into the tire barrier there, which cushions his uh, impact a bit. But, oh, that was really, uh, really something. And Mario must be shaken because he's not getting out of the car right away. 
Now he, of course, was blind. We'll have a full course yellow. He was blind behind Teo Fabio and he came inside. But it's a mental mistake because that car has been there for a while. That car, Roberto yes. Guerrero, has been there for the last four or five laps. Yes, and that's uh, that's one of those things, unfortunately, he's racing very hard. He thought he might have a chance. He pulls over. There's a full course yellow now. Mario is getting out of the car. He's obviously okay. Just, uh, uh, I'll tell you what, hitting, hitting it and impacting like that really hurts. Glad to see him making the moves. He's yes. uh, getting out of the car now. There we see the Horton safety team. Uh, what a job they do. They, they, are they there really do. They're they on really top are. of everything and they're very quickly. I, it's uh, Pancho Carter's car that went by and is obviously out for some whatever reason. Uh, his car is behind the Maryland. Here we see the uh, Guerrero car. Uh, the Alfa Romeo. It has uh, really been demolished with the impact. You know, you wonder about things like that, Charlie, because there you say the car had been there for four or five laps, and uh, now they've got a full course yellow. The field, will, the field yeah. will pack up and they get behind the pace car, but uh, the car had been there for four or five laps, and uh, it's just one of those things that, that there you can see how critical it is to have, not have that mental lapse. It's got to be right there all the time, and I, you know, it's, it's hard to understand what Mario might have. Here we'll have another look at it in slow motion. They're coming off of the turn. Mario tries to go to the outside a little bit. He swings over to try to get a run, and oh, it's too late. There's nothing he can do. It's it's there. You can see how it jostles him very hard. The car bangs the wall. And you saw Teo Fabi heading to the outside. Now we're going to make an assumption, and that is that the car that you saw just coming around behind him was Pancho Carter. But we are really not sure if that if that was the car that came in. No, we really we don't know if that was the car that was involved. There you see. Poncho's car in the background, so uh, he's obviously out of the race. All right, and we will continue with our coverage of the Toronto Indy. Welcome back to the Toronto Indy. We're still under a full course yellow due to the accident of uh, Mario Andretti, and he started. This is uh, this is on tape. He started back, and then he he stopped by the fence, and he was there for. It seemed as if he was there for almost four or five minutes, Johnny, and he was just getting his thoughts together. And you're a close friend of this man. You've known yes, him for many years. I, you know, Mario's still pondering that. He doesn't know quite what happened, it appears. And they, they're waiting on a cart, I think, to come get them. But he has an opportunity to reflect. And we can see it there in his face that he was reflecting. Now, let's look at the replay of the accident. Let me point out one thing, and you tell me if I'm correct. He moves to the outside. And he's now forgotten that the Guerrero's car has been there for six laps. He comes to the inside. He has a choice right here. Hit that car, go back into Teo Fabi. He hits the car on the side. He stays away from Teo Fabi. He plows right through it, and Fabi is not hurt at all and continues in the race. Well, that's in essence what happened, exactly, because Mario was making a move there, and he just obviously forgot that car, made his move, was so intent on keying on, on Teo that when he moved, bang, there was the car. He had nowhere to go. That was the end of it. But he stayed into that car rather than coming back out into Fabi. Well, also, I, I, don't think, yeah. I don't think Charlie had time, time to make the move. He had committed. And you can't just whip the car because it, it won't whip that fast. And he okay. closed on that car and hit it. Okay, and also, we saw in the shot that the car of Pancho Carter, we thought that was part of the residue of that accident. We have since found out that he was already there with a broken half shaft, and he was off the course he on was, the other side of the tire. He was off to the side, and yep. was obviously coasting with a, with a disabled car and just happened to be there at that time. Now, while we're still under full course yellow, we'll give you an opportunity to... Uh, kind of bring you up to date on the standings of all the drivers and and how they are early in the race. We have uh, 15 laps officially complete and this will give you the running order for the running second behind Sullivan and then it's Michael Andretti, Little Al, Bobby Rahal, Theo Fabi, Rick Mears, Ari Lyon Dyke. So actually when you look at the, the top seven they would be if you were to pick the top seven favorites. They are all running right at the right at the, uh, at the head of the list. That's exactly the way it comes down. You know, it's the teams that are prepared, and uh, those are the guys that we see week after week that are always running up front. Any key position, any one of them on any given day can could have a victory. So it's a very close battle. And of course, with the full course yellow, this closes everyone up, and it's a brand new race again. Kyle and getting Mario Andretti back into the pit. He was stuck on the outside of the wall. They had to get a golf cart to bring him back in. Mario was a long way back. What happened out there? Well, uh, there was a car.
Guerrero's car had blown up and it was sitting on the side right at the braking area for the hairpin and uh, and there was a we knew it was there it was a stationary flag and we're coming down I'm fighting for a position and actually I was trying under braking to get under Bobby and and I didn't see the flag so I assumed that it probably pulled the car at least further up because the safety station is right up ahead and and when Bobby pulled away, there was a car, and I, I just couldn't avoid it. I just you, you got wedged between the two cars. Is that what happened? Well, I, that's right. You know, I was just coming under Bobby, and I couldn't move over, and so I hit the, I hit the alpha. I saw you talking to Johnny Cable, uh, Roberto's team manager. He was pretty hot about something, and I couldn't quite hear it. Well, he was hoping that it would tow the car away, and then he was told that the car was at a safe spot, but it was at everything, anything but a safe spot, because all the action goes on down there before the corner, so I could see uh, the last few laps of the race to leave it there, but not at the beginning of the race, so I was really surprised, and then at the same time, there was no stationary yellow flag anymore, so... Um, to me, I thought that was a big mistake. Yeah, in your mind, then, they should have pulled the car uh, to Absolutely. a safe Absolutely, no question. There are too many cars still running out there and everybody competitively, running competitively for position, and you can't have an obstruction like that under braking. That's why I thought it was no way they were going to leave it there, and especially after they pulled the flag. Yeah, dangerous situation, then. Very dangerous. Okay, thank you, Mario. All right, thank you, Sal. Let's go over to Gary Gerald. Gary? Well, Charlie, here's another aspect of an unhappy man at this point. This is Rick Gallus, who owns the car of the defending champion, Al Unser, Jr. This goes back to the start of the race. You're running and working good, but you were not happy with the way this race started. No, not really. Uh, you know, I think I think he almost been going to sprint car tracks or something. He jumped the start, and it cost us, you know, three places. And uh, I'm surprised that Cart, you know, didn't catch it. Nick's a great, uh, great flagman. And I think what happened was they just, they can't really see the cars well enough and he almost was committed to throw the green flag, but it definitely was to our detriment. We're not very happy about it. It's tough to make up those spots now. It's hard to pass here, Gary. All right, Rick Gallus, he is not a happy man as he goes back now to check on the progress here of Al Unser Jr. Charlie? All right, thank you, Gary. Yeah, you know, I, Mario has more bad luck. He has had more trouble this year trying to just finish a race. And of course, the, uh, he has 21 wins on road course, which is the most of anybody. And, and he's, had tremendous success in the past. It just seems like it's one of those years when he can't uh, can't seem to get it together. Nick Bonaro, the flag man that you saw, and I've got to agree. Maybe he can't see him coming because they come right through exhibition curve. But I believe at the start he wasn't any question. I thought Emerson jumped the start. Well, the thing is, Nick is, is sitting up there with a headset on and he's listening to race control. And when race control says the green flag is out, let's go. He waves the green flag because he's counting on them to kind of help make the decisions. And so he's. He's just doing his job up there. So right. really Last week at Meadowlands, though, they, uh, they they took another lap because they, uh, rather than the green, the yellow came out, yes. and well, that, that was, was the same a, thing. That was a, a little bit different situation, uh, you know, in that they were strung out a whole yeah. lot more, and it really looked bad. But uh, you're right. They need to, uh, I think they ought to give it back to the flagman. Let him make the decision. He's up there in a key position where he can see the cars coming. Let him be the flagman, do the job that he's supposed to do. Because he's going to get the blame. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. He's getting it right now. That's right. He sure is. <laughs> The temperature in Toronto in the low 90s. It is hot and humid, and the Toronto Indy, the largest single event in the history of Canada as the crowds just continue to set records. That's John Andretti, as you see, and now we're looking for the green flag. The yellow is still out. The yellow is still out. As the Sullivan went by, yeah, and they stay in the same order as... Sullivan's been... Sullivan's been going to the same sprint car tracks, right. obviously. <laughs> he had to jump that time. Two he was ready to go. The pace car went off, and they just assumed uh, all of the drivers, I'm sure, just felt that, or those up front, just felt that uh, they were going to get the green, and they got the yellow. Well, that, I, I, I think John Andretti's car stopping on the course was the problem. So they want to make sure that that car is clear. We don't want to have the same problem as we had earlier. So now we have 20 laps complete. It is Danny Sullivan, Emerson Filippoli, Michael Andretti, the top three, back in a moment. Putting over the city of Toronto, the Goodyear Blimp America from Houston, Texas. The pilot is Mark Kynet of Woodlands, Texas. The aerial view is provided by the Goodyear Blimp America with its Gyrocam 360 camera. That's I mean, of course, you can look in beautiful shots. Degrees, beautiful it? shots. It's a beautiful city. All right, the leader is Danny Sullivan. He's led 16 of 20 laps. There's only been one lead change. Emerson Fittipaldi took the quick early lead. One caution for 11 laps. 
And now we're ready to go racing as we look for the green flag. And here we go. It is Danny Sullivan, Emerson Fittipaldi, Michael Andretti, Little Al, Bobby Ray Hall, Teo Fabi, Rick Mears, and Scott Pruitt. And they open up a quick gap between the other cars. This is a very critical time because you're coming off of cold tires. You've cooled your tires down. You've got to be cautious because they can slip on you. You make a couple of quarters. You feel them. If they're good, you stand on it. What happens when they get cold? Do they get harder? They're not as soft? Well, they, they don't just, grip they just as don't well? grip as good because they're not as pliable. Does any of the strategy change? Well, your, your bunch back up, and so you have an opportunity. Uh, obviously, uh, Sullivan is going to be pushing doing whatever he wants to out there. Lion Dyke we saw there coming back out onto the course. He's been in the pits for several laps, or at least for one lap uh, during that. Uh, changing plugs looked like he might have fouled him on the uh, slow laps. But Emerson is sitting there uh, just biding his time, waiting for his opportunity. Sullivan again is running away, though. And of your choices, it was Danny Sullivan, along, along with, all right, wait a minute. We've got an interrupt. Let's go down to Sally. Okay, Charlie, I am with Johnny Cable, he's the team manager for Roberto Guerrero. He's the one who was talking to Mario and Freddy and pretty hot about the situation out there. What were you telling Mario? Well, when uh, Roberto lost power in his March Alfa Romeo, he was coasting. We were informed by Cart that he was coasting. He may make it in. If he doesn't, they'll tow him in. When he came to a stop up against the wall, they said he came to a stop, and we don't know if we're going to tow him in or not. I said, you've got to tow him in. He's not in a safe position. They said... We just got radioed in that we've determined he's in a safe position. We're going to ask that he leave the race car, and we're going to leave the race car there. Roberto, had he been climbing out of that race car when it happened, he might not be here now. I, I have talked with the cart officials, and I, I just feel so strong about a mistake being made. We're all human beings. We can make mistakes, but we have never left a car on the circuit itself. Mario went by the car four different times. The last time when he decided to make a pass on somebody, he just assumed that the car had finally been picked up, and he drove right into the rear of our March Alfa Romeo and destroyed it. So you're saying that the decision by car divisions is what directly caused the accident? Yes. It, it, the car should have been towed in. There was ample time to tow it in, and naturally it would have been much safer. It was not a safe place. Either there was a lack of communication on Cart's part or just a lack of poor judgment and the decision-making process cost us an automobile and one for the Newman Haas team. I think it was just totally uh, unreasonable to have it that way. We've never done that before. Okay, Johnny, thank you very much. Now let's go to Charlie Jones. Meanwhile, back in the race, little Al Umser, as you saw, passed Michael Andretti and now has moved into third place behind Danny Sullivan, who is leading, and Emerson Fittipaldi, who is running second. Yeah, here and we here have a is. chance to look at it, Dave. We're going to rerun it. You can see that's the same thing Mario was trying to do a while ago uh, when he tried to go by Fabby. He's out breaking him, just running down in there a little bit deeper, taking him over, getting the line. He's into the corner, around it, making the pass. That was the uh, textbook. Ari Leyendijk has had all kinds of problems with that story. Let's go to Gary Jarrell. And Charlie, it was just as Johnny Rutherford had speculated. That caution was costly for Ari Leyendijk running the slow speeds. He fouled a plug. They came in. They gave him a new set. He went out. It's still misfiring. As you can see, he's back in. The crew's scrambling. It's going to be a long afternoon now and a disappointing one for Ari Leyendijk. Charlie? Thank you, Gary. And to pick up the train of thought that we had earlier, Emerson Fittipaldi with a great year, you said that Michael Andretti, Danny Sullivan, and little Al Unser would be the ones to take a run at him. And when you look at the top four, Danny Sullivan is leading, Emerson Fittipaldi is second, little Al is third, and Michael Andretti is running fourth. So an early congratulations Boy, on your we, pick. Aren't we great? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you can see them. Uh, Michael Andretti, of course, uh, who knows if he's got a problem. They, they said they wanted to, on their first pit stop, make a change to his car. So we're looking for that on that pit stop, and it's, uh, you know, he's uh, maybe just doing all he can, and when he gets whatever he's going to do on that pit stop done, bang, we'll see him make pressure to the front. And uh, Michael Andretti is running fourth. The leader is uh, Danny Sullivan. You can see here the number one car. That's number one for defending national champion. Emerson Fittipaldi is two. There is little Al, and then Michael Andretti, and that is Bobby Rahal and Teo Fabi as you take a look now at the top six. And they're all running very, very close. So nobody's letting anybody else get away very far. Get a chance to uh, maybe catch them in a slip, move in and closer and get a pass base. But uh, Al Unser Jr. is pulling away. Is this a race course that you could go away and hide on? 
Well, I think if you've got the power and you, your automobile is working properly, yes, you can distance someone, but it's not one that you can just really run away and hide. As you can see, all of these guys are on the class of the field, and they're staying very close to one another. Tell me about Emerson Fittipaldi. Are you surprised that he's not leading? Well, there again, you don't know what's happening to his car, how it feels to him. If he's just playing cat and mouse, this is one of the racetracks that you have to kind of guard your fuel mileage. You have to make sure that things are right. So maybe Emerson knows that if he doesn't squeeze it quite as hard in the beginning, when it comes to the end, he'll have enough to make it happen, and the others will be caught short. Going back to what you talked at the top, there's Ari Leyendijk, and he's having his problems again, as everybody seems to be able to pass him right now. Uh, he's crafty. He knows that you're not going to win the race in the first 30 laps. You've got to be there at the end. Yes, to finish first, you must first finish, and that's the key to any race. So obviously, and uh, Alan Sir Jr. has not been pressing that hard. He's by uh, the guy he was trying to pass, working on very hard, Michael Andretti. Now, third place, uh, working very hard to uh, try to catch up to uh, Emerson Fittipaldi. So he may be putting strain on his car. It's one of the things that you watch to see how it all comes out in the end. Who did what? What's happening? Are there telltale factors for the viewer at home? Things that you look for to see if a car is not working correctly. Well, you can obviously the stopwatch is your first indication. If he's going slow and everybody's running off and leaving him, you know, and there's distance being put on, then there may be something, something little. It doesn't take much to uh, to make you go off pace a little bit, and then you start falling behind. Or when your car gets corrected again, you start looking like a champ and start gaining. So it's uh, you know it's something you just watch these cars and see if who's able to pull away and, and who's able to keep up and just kind of make metal note and after the pit stop you'll notice the change sometimes is this a possibility too that uh that could have all these cars running so well that he can make the move anytime he wants to so he just wants to stay in stay right behind danny sullivan stay out of any kind of problems and make his move when he wants to and not when he has to well that's that's of course the thing we talked about uh, earlier is that he has a car that is, is probably capable of that but we won't know that until it comes down to the end when he pulls out all the stops and goes for it. Let's go down to Sally Larvick. Sally? Well, Charlie, Michael Andretti is having severe handling problems, and when they bring him in, they're going to make some adjustments to this front wing. He said that the, the front of his car is kind of floating. This, by the way, is an unusual front wing. Not many of these cars have it. This extra fin was added to give the front wing and give the car more downforce. And not only that, but the air that comes over the ring, wing stabilizes and causes less turbulence. They're hoping that when Michael comes into the pit, that they can take care of his problem, his handling problem, and that he will be well on his way to getting first place. Charlie? All right, thank you, Sally. We have 30 laps complete. Gary Gerald, are you ready? The negative aspects of that long yellow for R.A. Lyondike, one of the positives is fuel mileage that Johnny Rutherford was just talking about. Chuck Sprague, who's the team manager for Danny Sullivan, we asked him during a quick break, will the long yellow be a big help, a little help? How do you feel for fuel mileage? He said it will be a big help. So even though it's early and we get ready for the first stops, that may be have eased some of the pressure, some of the concerns for team managers and crew chiefs in this race here in Toronto. All right, Johnny, we now have 31 laps complete out of 103, and we've had the long yellow, so uh, we are, but we're still, we're getting in the neighborhood of the pit stop. Yes, and it's time for the these guys to start bringing the cars in for a drink. Uh, Al Unser in third place there. The, everyone is, is uh, thinking about that. The crews are getting ready. Uh, they're going to be making pit stops, and it will be interesting to see if it will whole, be wholesale or if it will be one at a time, you know, because everybody's faced with the same set of circumstances. All right, this is the Toronto Indy, and it is Danny Sullivan in the lead. Emerson Fittipaldi is running second. The Lallancer is third. Michael Andretti is fourth. Bobby Rahal is running fifth. Welcome back to the Toronto Indy. This is Charlie Jones along with three-time Indianapolis champion Johnny Rutherford. Gary Gerald and Sally Larvick are in the pits, and the top three are battling, and that's A.J. Foy. Now, he's now a backmarker. He is running at the tail end of the lap, and you see Danny Sullivan, Emerson Fittipaldi, and little Al Unser running one, two, three as they now start moving through some lap traffic. Yes, yeah, this could be very treacherous because lap traffic sometimes doesn't always see you. See A.J. move over there. He has to come back out and get set up for that corner. There he backs off, stops, slows down, lets everybody get around the outside. There you see Michael Andretti has closed up on Al Unser Jr. again, so we're, we've got a four-way tussle now. 
And it is Danny Sullivan, Emerson Fittipaldi, Al Unser Jr., and Michael Andretti. If they are running right together, then behind them is Bobby Rahal in fifth, Theo Fabi in sixth, Rick Mears in seventh, Scott Pruitt in eighth, Scott Goodyear is in ninth, the Canadian, and Raul Boisel is running ten. It will be interesting to watch if they all make their pit stops together. <laughs> Boy, that will be a scramble. And for those of you that joined us late, Mario Andretti is out as he ran into a car that had been stalled six laps earlier. That was the car of Roberto Guerrero had not been removed from the course. He made an inside move on Teo Fabi. The car was there and he ran into it. So he is out of the race. Also out of the race uh, is Pancho Carter and John Andretti. So four cars are out of the original 28, 24 are running. The way these first four have closed up again on one another, you wonder who's not working and who is working because sometimes when you use your fuel load up, it starts making the car handle differently. Differently, It bounds around a lot more because it's lighter. So uh, that will be uh, something to watch and see if anybody can get an advantage. If Sullivan should happen to slow down or if Lil Allenser or, you know, it's, this is a real dogfight and uh, to watch them get ready for their pit stops, which has to be coming up pretty soon. We have 36 laps complete. And it is Danny Sullivan who is leading Emerson Fittipaldi, Little Al, and Michael Andretti. They are the top four. And at least at this part of the race, they are the ones in main contention for the title. And all that's seem a, to be running pretty well. Oh, yes, extremely well. And that's a beautiful shot overhead to see the cars, to see the shape of the racetrack. There they're on the Lakeshore Drive down the back stretch. Little kink. It was down in this area that Mario made contact about here with that with Guerrero's car, which was very unfortunate. There you see situations with slower cars that try to maneuver on one another. Set a guy up, pin him in against a slower car. Boy, they are close. Danny Sullivan with Emerson could have fallen behind him and right in his tail pipe is little Al Unser, and you always look to see because they, as we mentioned a moment ago, they have a tendency of coming together. And they have put a little space between them and Michael Andretti, who is running for I think that was caused by some tra lap traffic. They're in the S's now and coming back out onto the straightaway heading for uh, Exhibition Corner, which is the start-finish line. That Sullivan is just running very smoothly. And uh, Exhibition Curve, one of the fastest corners. Yes, it's about 150 races. miles an hour around that turn, and it's, and it's a left-hander, so you're really leaning hard, and you're right up against the concrete. Sullivan, Fittipaldi, Unser, and now Michael Andretti has cleared himself of the traffic and is uh, closed up in four. You see the cars bouncing there, and that's another uh, indication that they're starting to get very light on fuel load because the car doesn't have the weight to kind of help hold it down anymore. And all of the little bumps and ripples in uh, Lakeshore Drive are causing it to kind of buggy ride, as we call it. And we have 38 laps out of 103 completed, and we still look. Uh, for the cars to come into the pit. And Danny Sullivan continues to lead. Two questions asked this year of the Indy card. What has happened to Emerson Fittipaldi? Why is he having such a great year? And now here's little Al, and he's going to be coming into the pit. So the question is the Pinsky cars. What has happened? Well, right now the Pinsky cars are running one and seven. Rick Mears is seventh. Danny Sullivan is running first. And yes, little Al in the Al Unser, he's in for a quick stop. We'll have to see just exactly how long with the uh, leaders. They'll start coming in now. Just uh, imagine wholesale. Uh, this uh, this is a this is a strategy move. It's a situation where he wants to get in, get his fuel load, get back out, make up the time he lost with the others making their pit stop. So uh, that may be a, a situation that will put him right back up in front when the others make their stop. You like that strategy? Come in first, so you can get yes, out. Yes, I've always, move. I've always liked to make my pit stop first. Teo Fabi made his stop, so uh, we'll see these guys maybe moving to the front of the pack uh, with this situation. You make your stop first, you lose the time, but you gain it all back. And if you can run very hard out there, and they have any kind of trouble, there's Sullivan. And Danny is coming in, and his pit crew is poised right across from our broadcast booth. And Gary Gerald is there, and let's go to Gary. All right, Charlie, here's the man who's been leading the race. He hits those 
this marks absolutely perfectly. What a joy for Danny Sullivan to be driving now free of pain in that right arm. He says, I can think about being a race driver once again. Fresh tires all the way around. They've already stopped off the field on the jack. He's rolling in 14 seconds. Good, strong stop. Oh, he almost collected a car going out of the pits. Got to keep two wheels inside that yellow line as he goes head toward Prince's Gate. But they're happy here in the Penske camp. And that's a good point that you make about the yellow line as the exit from the pits because in last year's race, there were five stop and go penalties for going all four tires over the yellow line. You can have two on the outside, but boy, you better have two on the inside or they're going to bring you in on a stop and go penalty. Here we see Emerson Fittipaldi. He's still on the track. And traditionally, Emerson has always, their crew has always been able to get good mileage. Okay, Emerson Fittipaldi into the pits, and Sally's there. Sally? Okay, Emerson Fittipaldi, he makes the stop right on the mark. He won this race in 1987. He sat on the pole in 1986. They're not going to change the setup at all. All they're going to do is change all four tires and refuel them. They're very satisfied with the way the car is working. They see Danny has to push. Danny has to win this race. Oh, Emerson, he's having trouble getting out of the pits because of Bobby Ray And so we come back to the situation that you talked about at the beginning of the telecast, and that is, that is the fact that when you have a situation with a bobble in the pits and you're running so well, you do not let it affect you. Right, that's it exactly. You just kind of suck it up, get ready. The car is capable of going out there and making up the difference for you. Meanwhile, Rick Mears now is taking the lead. He has not come into the pits. He'll lose that lead as soon as he comes back into the pits. Yes, they're getting set up now. So Rick has inherited the lead, but he's been running steady all day, and it could mean that he's in a good position to collect a spot or two here. And the time of the pit stops were the, the uh, 13 seconds, low 13 for Al Unser, high 13s as you saw, and then the one for Emerson Fittipaldi was up in the 14s, and possibly 15 or a little bit more. Now, those are all very good pit stops. Very good. What is the goal that you have? Now, Rick Mears, who is leading, is coming in to make uh, his pit stop, and so that, of course, will take him out of the lead. Now let's go down to Gary Gerald. Oh, he has to smoke one of the brakes just a little bit, Charlie. Now he hits the marks. Here's Mears in here, and they go to work on him. This Penske crew, of course, considered among the best in the business. The fresh rubber, which is routine, a full load of fuel. That's 40 gallons. It's better than 250 pounds of fuel being added to the car. Off the jack, lights up the tires, and Rick Mears is now away in that colorful number four. And there's the yellow line that we were talking about, and... Uh, and he had two on the left, two on the right, and that's okay. Al are now picking up some of the slower cars as now uh, the leaders have made it out of the pits and we will start sorting them out again as they'll go to the head of the pack as expected. Al Unser has the lead now, so that's exactly what he wanted to do by virtue of making that early pit stop. And so Al Unser has the lead. The leaders have all pitted. They will now be racing against each other. And we'll be back with our continuing coverage of the Toronto Indy in just a moment. Welcome back to Toronto Indy. We have nine cars on the lead lap. Al Unser Jr. has the lead. Michael Andretti has been closing down on him. Emerson Fittipaldi, who you see here, the car number 20, is running third. Danny Sullivan, who led the early part of the race, is running fourth. And Bobby Rahal is closing down on Sullivan. Rahal is fifth. Leo Fabi is sixth. Rick Mears is seventh, and uh, Fabricio Barbaza is running eighth. No, there are eight cars on the lead lap, as Boisel running ninth is a lap down. Well, here we see some racing going on back in the field. Uh, Michael Andretti is just chipping away at uh, Al Unser Jr.'s lead, and he's, he's running in second. He has steadily just been decreasing the space, so it's uh, they're in some back markers here, and it, uh, you've got to be very, very cautious. There's Al Unser, the leader. And, of course, there's Michael Andretti, who's running second. Now let's go down to Sally Larber. Okay, the Fittipaldi team was very upset after Emerson made his last pit stop. If he tried to get out of the pit, there was a tire in the way, and the tire came from Bobby Rahal's pit. And Pat Patrick especially was upset when uh, you saw Emerson having a tr trouble getting out of the pit. You immediately went to card officials. What did you tell them? Well, the tire was in the way, and... Uh... It held us up at least two seconds, maybe three. I think it cost us a position. We should have gone out in the lead. 
The problem was that the tire you thought was over the white line? Well, it doesn't matter if it was a white line or where it was in front of Emerson's uh, car, and he couldn't drive it. It wasn't done intentionally. It was, a, it was an honest mistake. In fact, it wasn't even a mistake. We could at the same time. Just uh, it shouldn't have happened. Do you think this is going to be a costly mistake for Emerson? No, not really. It's just one of those things. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Charlie. Emerson Fittipaldi is currently running third. And last year he was fourth. He won here in 87. And the first year in 1986, he finished 17th. And we have a report on car number 91 that is Scott Goodyear's car, one of the Canadian favorites. He is out of the race due to overheating. And also this is Ludwig Heimer's car, number 71. And uh, looks as if he is going to be out of the race we have a car cam aboard and it has come to an abrupt halt yes and he took his helmet off so ludwig is uh, out of the picture as they say we see al Unser jr he is uh, sitting there hammering as hard as he can because he knows he has michael andretti sitting right there in second place has been closing up just ever so slightly it went from about from nearly a five second lead down to now to where it's about a one and a half second lead and that's Fabrizio Barbaza, who is currently in eighth place that you see in the pits. And uh, Gary is in the pits. Gary Gerald. Well, Charlie, remember earlier we were talking with Rick Gallus, and he was unhappy about the start of the race, and he thought that sprint car start gave an unfair advantage to Fittipaldi. Said it's tough to get the positions back. On the round of pit stops, however, it was little Al who got the lead. And we remember back one year ago, Danny Sullivan was the leader coming into the pits in the race, and it was in the pits that the Gallus crew won the race for little Al Unser. They say that that turnaround and that event one year ago in Toronto was really the springboard to make them competitive for that national championship honors they're wondering if this could be another springboard here today because their man now has the lead Fabrizio Barbazzi dropping down a lap as he when he came into the pit so he's off of the lead lap that means we now have seven cars on the lead lap Al Unser Jr. is first Michael Andretti is second Emerson Fittipaldi is third Danny Sullivan is running fourth Bobby Rahal is fifth Teo Fabi is sixth and Rick Mears is running seventh. The champion should be decided by one of those seven cars. And uh, this really bodes well for an outstanding finish to this race. Oh, it, you know, it, it, the heavy is on them because they all have to perform here. And of course, Emerson is uh, sitting back there in a position where he needs to get some of this lap traffic. There's a whole gaggle of cars. And you can see Ray Hall sitting back there and Danny Sullivan trying to get through that pack of cars. So. You try to get a guy set up in this kind of a situation so you can make a pass. There was uh, Bobby Rahal trying to pass Robo Cell. So this is also a very critical situation because anybody can slip, take out the whole group. And we have officially 57 laps complete of 103. The total race 300 kilometers or 183 miles. And the road course is 1.78 miles. Now, let's give you a race summary as what happened through the first 50 laps. The leader, Al Unser Jr., he has led eight of the 50. There have been four lead changes, one caution for 14. Nine cars on the lead lap. That now has dropped down to only seven. And we have six cars out of the race. This is the official after 50. And these are the cars that are out of the race. Guerrero with an engine. Uh, Mario Andretti hit the, uh, the Guerrero car. Carter with a half shaft. John Andretti mechanical. Larry Leyendijk in and out. Lots of problems. Electrical. And Goodyear out is overheating. You know, the attrition rate in these races is, is slimming down. We don't see as many cars, so the, I think the class of the cars is, the overall field is much better than it's ever been, and so the cars are, are lasting better and running longer. Well, one of the things when they talk about, you know, over the past few years, the domination of the Penske cars, is everybody catching up to Roger? Well, I don't know. Are they learning from him? I don't know if it's catching up. It may be learning, you know, learning from him because he comes out with some really very nice race cars, and I think they've just had a run of bad luck, he and and Rick Mears. And we'll be back to the Toronto Indy in just a moment. Now it's official after 60 laps complete. It is Al Unser Jr. who is leading. Michael Andretti is running second. Emerson Fittipaldi is third. Danny Sullivan is fourth. And Bobby Rahal is running fifth. The other two cars on the lead lap are Teo Fabi and Rick Mears. Here we see Bobby Rahal trying to uh, get into position, but he just it wasn't quite close enough to make the pass there as they go through the hairpin on uh, Lakeshore. 
up this short straightaway headed for the stadium turn very tight in there where you go from one side of the road to the other a lot of concrete Ray Hall is still trying to push into position so he can outbreak Sullivan and gain that position all right let's go down to Gary Gerald well, Charlie, we talk about mid-season racing developments. We discerned a piece of information just as this race got underway that affects next year, and it affects or pertains to the Penske PC-18 chassis, the one that Fittipaldi's had so much success with. Vince Granatelli has agreed today that he is going to purchase three PC-18 chassis from Penske. That's this year's chassis to run in the 1990 season next year. He'll continue to stick with his Buick-powered program, but he thinks that that chassis is going to help make him competitive. John Andretti, as you mentioned a bit earlier, his driver today already out of the race. Granatelli thinking about 1990 with some interesting news coming from Pitt Road here today in Toronto. All right, thank you, Gary. But that also means that Roger Penske will uh, have out the PC-19. He brings oh, out yeah. a new one every year. Yeah, he comes with a new one every year, and that's the way you do when you build cars like that, is you sell off the cars, and hopefully the new car will uh, will be better. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it is, sometimes it isn't. Here we see Al Unser Jr. He is still has them hooked up and has been able to put just a little bit more time between himself and and uh, Michael and Reddy. So it's uh, they're kind of stalemated right now, waiting for the next pit stop. The lap distance. 1.78 mile road course and Al Jr.'s last lap speed is just over 103, 103 and a half miles per hour. Well, that's uh, that's still moving along when you have nine turns to uh, negotiate or 11 and it's uh... And now after 60 laps, the running order to give you an opportunity to check up on where your favorite driver is in this the fourth Toronto Indy and what has become a truly tremendous event the crowds have uh, been here for the last three days for practice and for all of the qualifying and it is truly a spectacular happening in the city of Toronto it really is Charlie I have been here for every one of the races and it is incredible the, the following that this race has garnered in those three four years now because the first year it was very good they sold out the second year they couldn't print enough tickets and it's been getting better and better every year the weather, it is very warm today. The temperature officially, when, uh, the, when the, the gentlemen all started their engines, was 91 degrees, and the humidity had to be pretty close behind it, running a very yes. close second. Yes, you can feel it. Yes. There we see a good shot of Michael Andretti going through the Lakeshore hairpin, chasing there. You can see the space between he and Al Unser Jr. He's still pushing very, very hard. He's very consistent. He doesn't have a problem today. Like I said earlier, maybe his day. And we gave you a complete rundown of all 28 cars that were in the starting grid. That is Al Unser Jr. leading. Michael Andretti, the car number six, is in second place. His father, Mario, in case you join us late again to repeat, is out of the race uh, due to an accident. There was a car, Roberto Guerrero's. That was left of the racetrack. He was abandoned it after he had some problems. And uh, making a move on the inside of Teo Fabi Mario for a moment apparently forgot the car was there and ran right into it. He yes, is, by the way, might, is all right. Yeah. yeah, we might add he is yeah. okay other than probably a, a few bruises and a uh, bruised uh, ego maybe because that was really, that was a hard hit. There is second place, Michael Andretti giving chase. And that is the seventh car. The seventh car is Rick Mears. He is running seventh and uh, is ready now to uh, to get himself lapped if he doesn't uh, step on it a little bit. Yeah, I don't think there's any way he can stop uh, Al Unser Jr.'s charge because Al is working extremely well. Uh, he Al, really is running well, isn't he? He is. He is. He's, uh... Let's go down to Sally. Okay, Gary Gerald was talking about rumors, and they persist at this time of the year, especially drivers changing. Well, here's a rumor that we found out about. It was rumored that Danny Sullivan was going to go to Porsche and that Teo Bobby was going to form his own team. Well, not so. Derek Walker tells me that he has never talked to Danny Sullivan and that Teo Bobby is expected to sign up again with him next year, at least by the Michigan race, which is only a couple of weeks away. 
one rumor that, however, may turn out to be true is the fact that Porsche may run two cars next season. They're going to try it out possibly at Laguna Seca, and if it works out well, they'll run a second car next year. Charlie? And one of the things, of course, that we look for is the Porsche car here to come out and uh, pop for that first win. They, they seem to get closer and closer, but they haven't really, Teo Fabi has not really challenged that much here. If you did just join us, here is Teo Fabi in the green. That is Mario Andretti behind him. This was uh, on the ninth lap of the race. Yeah, you can see there he just pulls over to try to outbreak him into that turn, and oh, there was the car. What a tremendous explosion of pieces. Tires flying in the air. Our Mar Mario hits the wall again. Teo is getting under control now. He sees Mario's car, and Mario is just sitting there for the ride. And that was the car, Roberto Guerrero, who was out on the third lap with an engine problem. The officials in there, has been a lot of controversy yes. and a lot of uh, very angry talk had decided to leave the car there and not move it. Well, since then, of course, after that accident, it has been moved. Yeah, there we see uh, Al Unser Jr. has finally made his pass on Rick Mears getting by, and uh, that will give him a little daylight, a little breathing room to be able to work and get away from Michael again. There's Michael not far behind. Rick Mears with three top ten finishes here at Toronto, eighth, tenth, and sixth over the last three years, but now he has dropped off of that lead lap. Bobby Ray Hall is uh, currently running in fifth position. He's chasing Sullivan. We get a look through his over his shoulder in the camera. There you see through the stadium turn heading for the sweeper. Now, this part of the course is really, uh, really quick through here because you're you're trying to get gears. You're it's just fast enough that if you slip a little bit, bang, you're into that wall. And so it is Al Unser Jr., Michael Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi, Danny Sullivan, Bobby Rahal, and Teo Fabi on the lead lap. We're back to our coverage of the Toronto Indy with Al Unser Jr. leading. Michael Andretti is running second. Emerson Fittipaldi in car number 20, you see there, is running third. Danny Sullivan is fourth. Bobby Rahal is fifth. And Teo Fabi is in sixth. And those are the six cars on the lead lap. Here we have Kevin Kogan, number 11, in for a pit stop. See the guys putting fuel in and the uh, changing the tires. Michael Andretti is still giving chase to Al Unser Jr. So this is uh, this is quite a race. Al Jr. has led the last 28 laps, and in Michael Andretti's pit is Sally Larvick. Sally. And we're waiting for Michael Andretti. There he comes. He comes into the pit. He stops on the mark. He's running his own setup here. He had handling problems in an earlier pit stop, but they were able to fix those by changing the front wing. He's looking for his first win since 1987. Only fresh tires, some fuel, and Michael Andretti is lost. 13.5 seconds. Good pit stop, 33 pit laps stop. to go for him. Excellent pit stop, and of course, there you have a situation where you're trying to gain position by making your pit stop before the other guys. And when you go back out, we saw a little Al Unser have his opportunity a while ago to stop early, come back out in the lead. Now, Michael Andretti, when he made his exit from the pit, he dropped to fifth position, so he is still well within striking distance because the four drivers ahead of them all still have to pit. Yes, that's the strategy of making your stop first. And of course, this is the last one, so it'll be all the way to the checkered from here. There we see Al Unser Jr. He's just running like he's on a rail out there. He really has been running well, hasn't he? He has extremely well been able to, to uh, open up distance on Michael when he wanted to a while ago, and now he's out there all by himself. And once that he has taken the lead, he has really not been challenged for the lead. No, he really hasn't, other than getting caught in slow traffic, backing up to Michael, and when he gets clear, he's always able to pull away again. Could this be his day? Uh, it could be. I, you know, he's uh, certainly plenty capable, more than capable. The hottest man this year is car number 20, and that is Emerson Fittipaldi. And, uh, he led early in the race, but it's not really been a challenger. Is he still waiting? Does he still have time? 32 laps to go. Well, it's very hard to say. You know, you can you can speculate. Oh, we've got a car. That's A.J. AJ Boyd. Boyd is slowing down on the course, pulling off to the side. He's obviously dead in the water, has some serious problems. Getting back to that situation with Emerson, you know, you don't know if he's, if he's playing cat and mouse or not. He had, knows that he's got a situation, and he wants to wait and play a hand. He's within striking distance. So here we go with Ray Hall. Ray Hall's caught up to Sullivan again. So obviously uh, Sullivan has been holding Ray Hall up. 
Sullivan is running third. Ray Hall is running fourth. Now, Bobby needs to get past him so he can make a move on the two leaders. Well, they're all coming up on pit stops, so it's jockeying for position in order to get in and get back out as quickly as you possibly can. All of these stops have been on green. They always are on road courses because they very seldom do you ever have an opportunity at the right time with a full course yellow where you can get in and get out and not lose a great deal of time. When you come into the pit, it's like a little parking area. You come in and do a quick parallel park. Like this. There's Sullivan and Ray Hall going oh, that after was, him. Uh, yeah, he was making a bid there. And I think Ray Hall's running better than Sullivan. I'm, it, it appears that way because while ago he got caught in traffic and moved back away, he's caught right back up to him again. And the car cam of Bobby Ray Hall's car, you see we're having a little bit of a breakup, so we can't stay with that shot just enough to give you a feel of what it's like. And now Sullivan tries to open up a little space. And Emerson Fittipaldi comes into the pit. Let's go to Sally. Emerson Fittipaldi, the team is still not concerned that Emerson is in third place. They figure that they know that his car has the speed and he'll be able to catch up right now. They're changing four tires. They're just refueling it. As you recall earlier, he had some trouble getting out of pit line. Watch him now. No problem at all. Emerson is out. 14.9 seconds. And Chris Sailing coming out of the pit. Excellent pit stop, and of course, uh, now he'll have to wait for the others to see where they all fall into position. He pitted second, and when he came out, he was fifth. Not a bad move. Now, is there a driver problem back to when you come into the pit to find that little area and duck kind of into it and then duck back out? Well, it, you know, if a while ago, obviously, with Ray Hall making a stop at the same time, there was his, put, his pits were cluttered, so uh, Emerson had a, had a tire to try to have to get them to move so he could get out. Yes, it can be. You try to time it, find out when the other teams are going to make their stops, and if you can time it, you can get into a clean pit and get back out again. It is Al Unser Jr., Danny Sullivan, Bobby Rahal, Michael Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Teo Fabi, and they are all on the lead lap. It's interesting. They all pitted running second and have come out running uh, fifth now, so uh, it's uh, the move up. Here's where we see where, it, where the pit stops count. And they're getting ready to pit in Danny Sullivan's pit. They're over the wall and waiting for him to come in. Sullivan has some cars here that he has to negotiate. Fabrizio over Bazin 12 there. Moved to the inside and kind of blocked him. So we'll have to wait and see now if Danny comes in this lap. If he does, then the, uh, Ray Hall will have a chance to uh, make a little time up. And the pit crew is ready, as you can see. And A.J. Foyt made it back to his pit. They're doing a quick tire change to give him a little fuel. And here is Sullivan with Ray Hall behind him. Yeah, they're very, very close there. A lot of, uh, a lot of good hard racing right here. And Danny Sullivan is coming into yes. the pit. He turns in, Ray Hall goes by. So Ray Hall's still on the track, and Sullivan is now coming in to make his pit stop. And here is Danny Sullivan in the pit. And they're changing, changing all, all, four, four all four tires. Getting fuel. They don't appear to be making any adjustments to wings or anything. The car must be working well for him, or he, at least his like he's down, Ooh, he's out. Well, oh, he oh, killed it. Stall. He's killed the engine. It was a 12.9. What a great stop, but he killed it. Now it's going to be probably up. Oh, that is. This could cost you the race. The oh, championship could be lost right here. That is incredible. As something is has happened. Away. Something has happened. The thing is not running properly or something. Oh, there they go. Kick the oh, tires. They, It'll start. No, oh, they, he's on burnt rubber coming out. Somebody pulled off the hose and it, uh, oh, that was a tremendous. It, it appeared that they pulled the air hose off the car, dropped. Danny was ready to go, but they were still fueling. And Teo Fabi in and out, and he is burning rubber. Oh. And Danny Sullivan is down a lap. He loses a lap in the pit. That is incredible. He was stalled through the stall a total his uh, almost 35 seconds, almost 35 seconds in the pit, including the stall. Al Unser is slowing. He's is he out of fuel? Did he wait too long? It appears that he has stopped on the course. He is either out of fuel or for whatever reason. That is really a shame. 
because we were expecting him to come in at any moment. And remember, of the, of, the, of the group before, he was the first one into the pit. Yes, he pulled the wheel off, threw it over the windshield in disgust, and it's obviously all over for Al Unser Jr. And so with these turn of events, Bobby Rahal is in the lead. Bobby has been pushing extremely hard. His car is working well, and of course, he won last week in the rain at the Meadowlands. So Bobby Rahal is uh, certainly hungry for another victory. There we see Al Jr. getting out of his car. He's got to be through for the day. He's not staying in to wait for the toe back to the pits. He is uh, out of contention. Now, the positioning of this car it comes to your mind, the Roberto Guerrero car. Are they going to remove this car? I'm sure they will. That one is not in as precarious a position as Guerrero's was because it's on the out inside of a turn where they go around. So, yes, obviously. All right, let's go down to Garrett. Boy, you talk about disappointment, Charlie. Rick Gallus just hurled his clipboard down, ripped off his headset when they found out what happened to Little Al. We're still not clear if it was a problem other than fuel. He said, give me a moment. He's so upset he didn't want to talk. We'll try to get that report from him as quickly as possible. But the disappointment, just astounding. One other observation on Sullivan's stop. It looked like as we leaned over the pit wall, three pits away, that they just didn't get the fuel in. They went up the second time and then got the fuel in. Let's get see if we can get Rick. Can you can you give us a... a yeah, we made a, one of our guys in the pits just made a mistake on the fuel calculation. We didn't make it. All right, you can tell the disappointment there. A miscalculation on fuel has cost the defending champion an opportunity to repeat. Charlie? Little Al led for 35 laps. He is out of fuel. He's out of the race. We'll be back. Rick Mears is in the pit. Mears is currently running in fifth place. And he is down a lap. So Ray Hall, Andretti, Fittipaldi, and Sullivan are all running on the lead lap. You can see there the air jacks didn't do their job. The pressure must be down. The car didn't come all the way up. The guy had to lift the side pod to get the car up high enough to put the tire on. So he's got all four tires, a load of fuel, back into the race. So both of the Pinsky pits have had problems. Danny Sullivan the last time that he was in, and now Rick Mears. And yes. Bobby Ray Hall is the leader. Yes, those are the little things that really hurt you in the long run. Now, Ray Hall has not pitted. He is getting a good fuel mileage. He got good fuel mileage last week at the Meadowlands in the rain. But he's still going to have to pit. But according to our calculations, he doesn't have enough space between himself and Michael Andretti, who is running second, to be able to hold the lead. And now he's in the pits. And let's go to Gary Gerald. He's leading by about nine seconds. Well, we look at him come right in, smoothly glides into the stop. The man who has never finished worse than fifth here at the Cranes, the rest of the team, Barry Green, delighted with the stop for the race leader, Bobby Rahal. Let's see if it's good enough to keep him up there, Charlie. He keeps him in third place. He was first when he came in, third when he went out. And so the chase is on. And it is Michael Andretti who has the lead. Emerson Fittipaldi is running second. And Bobby Rahal is third. Yes, that's uh, Michael uh, was in the right spot. And you see the the Horton safety vehicle. Now this is Scott, Scott Pruitt, who is in seventh. Pits getting uh, having a pit stop. He's down off of the jacks. He threw out his drink bottle. He's got a problem. They've got to back him back up into the pits. It's hard to tell. No, he stalled the engine. That's what happened. And they've got to restart. They hook the starter up, get the thing running, and he's got it again into right gear this time and gone. And Scott Pruitt has been his six or better in the last five kart races, and that pit stop could cost him really a continuation good. of that. There we see Michael Andretti, the leader. And uh, when we saw the Horton safety vehicle a moment ago, that is because of the car of uh, little Al Unser who ran out of fuel. And so uh, that car has not been removed. But however, it is, uh, you know, there's a lot of flashing lights and flags so that everybody knows about it. Let's go to Sally Larvin. Okay, let's, let's get a better explanation on the two Penske pit stops. Very disappointing for you, Chuck. Let's take Danny Sullivan first. What happened? Well, I just got the thing parked with the front end too far out, and by the time we'd picked up on it, we were committed to changing the tires. 
but the guys did a pretty good job of getting the thing pulled back, so we got it done on the same stop without having to come in again. It was a long pit stop for you, though. Much longer than we like, yeah, but the, the true test of a team is how they do when things go wrong, and I think these guys did a good job of recovery. And then, and then Rick Muir, problem with the air jet. Uh, now, that looked pretty routine to me. It looked like the, the uh, fuel nozzle just triggered shut once, and they had to reset it. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Back to Charlie. And those two pit stops, though, very costly to the Pinsky team. Michael Andretti has the lead again. Michael, with all but one race this year, has had the lead at one yes. time or another and has run very well. But luck has always seemed to turn against him. So let's see. Perhaps this is a turnaround. Like Emerson. I say, the law of averages is, is bound to turn around for him here. And if he's in the right place now, he could be the winner today. And Emerson Fittipaldi, who is having the year of all years, is currently running second. And he will be chasing down Michael Andretti as he goes around Vikas. And Bobby Rahal is running third. Danny Sullivan is running fourth. We have four cars on the lead lap. Now, earlier, Johnny Rutherford had a chance to take us kind of inside to give us a note or two about braking if you're a driver. You know, it's hard for the average enthusiast to realize the forces and violence generated by a modern race car today. Take braking, for example, of an Indy car or a GTP car. Crew chiefs will tell you that the initial braking ability of a ground effects car from 180 miles an hour will exert about five Gs on you. Now that relates to coming from 180 to 70 miles an hour, which is a rate of 110 miles an hour per second. Now what does that feel like? Your passenger car running 55 miles an hour would have to stop in this distance, 20 feet, for you to experience that sensation. And I'm here to tell you that can put bruises on your body. And there have been some bruises on some bodies here today. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Well, you talk about bruises and disappointment. Here's another case. We don't know why, but Bobby Rahal just came gliding into the pits. He immediately shut down the engine. The crew, we were alerted because they were scrambling with buckets. That's the indication of perhaps overheating or fire. There was no fire. They have pulled the back cowling off, Charlie and Johnny, and they're just looking. And right now, we're at a loss as to what they're looking for. But obviously, Bobby Rahal is not going to be able to win two in a row on the CART PPG IndyCar circuit. We'll try to find the reason and let you know in just a moment. Uh, Gary, was the engine dead when he pulled in? No, Johnny, it was running when he came in. He revved it. We saw a lot of uh, uh, fumes come from the back, like uh, heat, uh, obviously very, very hot. And then we saw all of the uh, containers of water up here. In the event, there was an overheating problem. But now he's unbuckling and climbing out. And so it is the end of the day for Bobby Rahal, and so he is out. The attrition that you talked about now is starting to take place. We'll be back in just a moment. Michael Andretti is the leader. Welcome back to Toronto Indy, as we now have 91 laps complete in fourth place. That is Teo Fabi, but he is down a lap. Michael Andretti is the leader. Emerson Fittipaldi is running second. Danny Sullivan is in third. And we, at this point, we are sorting out whether he is running on the lead lap or not. There are those that think that he is, and those of us that think that he is not. <laughs> <laughs> and the vote in the booth is two and two. So it's a stalemate. Here we see Michael Andretti making a pass on Kevin Kogan. And Sullivan is a lap down, so Michael Andretti and Emerson Fittipaldi are running on the lead lap. Now, Bobby Rahal has had his problems for that story. Let's go down to the pits and join Gary Gerald. Gary? Well, the man who has had such great success here in Toronto is not enjoying that success today. What turned out to be the problem, Bobby? Uh, I guess the uh, exhaust, uh, exhaust broke, cracked, and then the fire coming out just burnt through the plug wires. But uh, too bad, looking good. You had a problem like this late in a practice session or qualifying session yesterday, related? No, no, it's a totally different thing. Awful tough on that roller coaster after the elation of a week ago to this day. Well, you know, I thought we were looking real good, and we were. You know, who knows if they could have made the, uh, the fuel, but uh, we just ran hard and did our best, and this wasn't our day. Were you being held up at all by Danny Sullivan when you were on the circuit? Well, a little bit, but um, I was conserving my brakes, and so I was sort of content to let it just sit there. Bobby's out of the race, Charlie. 
All right, thank you, Gary. The story now evolves around Michael Andretti. One of the most popular of the young drivers of the Indy cars has had success in a lot of other formulas, but is still looking for his first Indy car win. He has 10 laps to go. Could this be the day, Johnny Rutherford? Well, the first win this season, Charlie, yes. He's got, I think, seven victories uh, to his credit yeah. so far in IndyCar racing. But Michael is, uh, yes, it looks like if he goes to the end, he can do it. But he's got wily old Emerson Fittipaldi, who all of us know is on a tremendous roll this year, just sneaking up ever so slightly every lap. So it will boil down to they're both ready to go to the finish. Which one will make it there first? You're right with the correction, looking for his first win of this year, but it, it seems like as much as he is challenged that it must be very frustrating. Oh, he's, you know, he's led every lap, uh, every, I mean, every race this season except for one. He's doing extremely well. Uh, he just has some rotten luck. Well, today it may be over. Now let's go down to Sally. Charlie is very quiet in the Andretti pit. This is the time that they have faced time and time again when the pressure was on, when he was so close to winning and then didn't make it. And, and Sandy, you have been sitting there praying, talking to yourself. How do you feel right now? We just need to see the checker. We have a hard time seeing the checker flag. We just need to see that checker flag. He has been so close before. Do you think this might be it for him? Do you think he might take the checker? Well, we'll see if Emmo's coming up on him. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see until the checker comes down. <laughs> she doesn't. You're not, you're not looking fast. Lap 94. So the total to be run here is 103, and he has a lead over Emerson Fittipaldi of just under six seconds. But it was about four seconds a while ago, so he has been able to add on to it, Charlie, and that's what you look for. And I think Michael, if he doesn't have any problems between now and the checkered, he'll be awfully tough to beat. Now, as a driver, you've been in this position. We'll give you a race summary after 90 laps and come back to my question. Michael Andretti, he has led for 12 of the 90 laps. Six lead changes, one caution for 14 laps. That's when his father went into the car of Guerrero. Three cars on the lead lap. I think that is only now two cars on the lead lap, and 10 cars are out of the race. Guerrero out with an engine. Andretti hit the Guerrero car when he was still on the track. Carter with a half shaft. John Andretti mechanical. Larry Leyendijk electrical. Goodyear out overheating. Heimrath ignition, Naco with the contact, uh, Unser out of gas, and Ray Hall with the engine problems that he just talked to Gary Gerald. And let's go back down to Gary. Can you catch him, Gary? Well, that's what we're about to find out. Pat Patrick anxiously leaning over the wall, stopwatch in hand, trying to look for that uh, Marlboro car. There it is. We'll let him get the interval. What do you think? Can you catch him? We don't know, Jerry. We think we can. We're telling Emerson he can. We think Michael may be short on fuel because. Telling him on the radio, he must catch Michael now. If we can get him uh, mad enough, he'll, he'll probably try it. <laughs> All right, Pat, thank you. Interesting right, approach, Charlie. Don't you love it? The coach says you must catch him now. <laughs> and Emerson is out there with his foot all the way to the fourth. I'm going as fast as I can. All right. We'll be back to finish up the race in just a moment. As we come back to Toronto Indy, Michael Andretti has four laps to go. Emerson Fittipaldi is chasing him, and he is closing on it. Oh, yes, ever so slightly. It's not going to be easy, because once he gets to him, then he has to pass him. There, Michael has the advantage of putting a couple of back markers between himself and Emerson. So now he has clear track in front of him, unless he runs into some more traffic. M.O. has to get by those guys. And we sorted it down from 28 cars to these two as the wives look on. Sandra Andretti. Yeah, she's been, uh, we were, there's uh, Teresa Fittipaldi in there wringing her hands, saying little prayers. Meanwhile, with their hands full is Michael Andretti, who is leading, and Emerson Fittipaldi, who is running second. And they are the only two cars on the lead lap. Danny Sullivan is in third a lap down. Theo Fabi is in fourth, Rick Mears is in fifth, and they, of course, are all running a lap down. I can guarantee you, Michael Andretti, if he hasn't had radio problems, is getting word in his ear, stand on the gas. Kid. And he's got three laps to go, and Fittipaldi continues to close four laps back. He had almost a five-second lead on him, and now it is 2.4 seconds. 
There we can see the distance. He is really closing up. Michael has slower cars in front of him. This could be the critical moment. Teo Fabi in front of Michael Andretti, and then it's Emerson Fittipaldi right behind him. Yes, I'm sure Michael is praying that Teo will be a gentleman and let him by so he can use him as a buffer between himself and Emo. Teo a lap down. He comes inside of him. Fabi stays high. And now the car will be between Michael Andretti and Fittipaldi. And he Emo moved, uh, he he moved over for move. him and let Emerson go by, and now Emerson is right on his bumper. Yeah. And they Very come by close. the start-finish line. And the separation is less than a second. Just under a second. With two laps to go. Well, now here we'll see, because this is the opportunity for Michael to uh, show us what they've got. And he's got traffic. He's coming up on some more traffic. So Emerson will try to outbreak him. There they bump. Emerson. Emerson, Emerson slides slide on him. by. That's if Michael's car was not damaged, he has had it. That's it. And Emerson is hit, and now he backs off, and he he obviously is all right. Both wives, very, very, Teresa and Sandy, both very emotional. They heard the word that they collided, but now I think the word is out. Emerson just tried to make the move, at the, the move breaking him on the inside. And Michael Andretti continues to lead Emerson Fittipaldi continues to run second they are the same lap but the margin now has widened considerably oh yes Michael has a comfortable cushion and should be able to uh, make his last lap now one more lap one white lap flag to is go. down there we see the white flag waving Emerson has not come by as yet he took a lot of time to get turned around and now Emerson Fittipaldi comes by the start finish line and it is a 13 second differential after the bump yes Emerson just tried here we'll look at it again Emerson was trying to outbreak him down on the inside Michael was headed for the inside they touched it slammed Emo over he barely skinned the wall but he slid past the turn Michael was able to turn behind him make the corner properly and that was the name of that too and Michael had the line going into the turn he definitely did he might have been squeezing it a little bit to try to block to keep him back but that's racing. And so we are on the final lap. And it is Michael Andretti who is leading. Coming around now to take Nick, Trevor, Nick uh, Fenora's checkered flag. What a feeling. He's coming out of the last turn now, heading toward the checkered flag, Michael Andretti. And a standing ovation from the fans as he comes through. And we wait now for Emerson Fittipaldi, his official second place finish, as he comes by. And both cars at the end, after the bumping, continue to run well. And both drivers, of course, are all right. What did you ask me at the head of the show, Charlie? Here's Michael Andretti. The long drought is over. There have been handshakes, hugs, kisses, you name it. A lot of emotion down here and certainly well-deserved. It's been a tough ride to finally get to victory lane. It was a tough drive, one of my toughest. Uh, everything went my way today. It makes up for all those times where uh, we were having problems. So uh, I'm really happy. Um, you know, with Al Jr., it looked like he ran out of gas, I'm not sure. And, uh, uh, you know, that break with Emerson. This has been characterized as the season of the bump and run. There was a bump and you were able to run there in that next to last lap with Emerson Fittipaldi. How close was it in your mind? Well, it's unusual for me to come away with uh, without anything bad, you know? So you know I didn't do it on purpose because I would have taken myself out too, you know, if I would have done that. So it was just a bad deal. I feel bad that it happened, but uh, that's the way it goes. Earl Haas offering his congratulations. Wife Sandy is here. Our congratulations to Michael Andretti as we check now with our colleague Sally Larvey. Yeah, I'm with Emerson Fittipaldi, and right now he's explaining what happened. Emerson, it's got to be very disappointing for you. You were doing so well, and then you bumped. What happened? Yeah, I didn't bump. I was on the inside of Michael, and uh, I think he didn't realize there was a car there. I don't know what happened to Michael. Well, if it helps at all, he apologized for it. He feels bad about it, but he says that also that's racing. Was it, was it that race? I, you know, I think if everybody watch on tape, if they replay, uh, obvious someone has to be right in the meantime the car was working very well for you is that true in the nose right now 
And that, of course, was Mo Nunn. Mo, how do you feel about that? Mo is, of course, the, the, the chief engineer for Emerson's car. How, what are your feelings about what happened? I feel that's absolutely blatant, dangerous driving. You can kill somebody doing something like that. So you feel it was Michael's? Absolutely. Watch the TV. Okay, very disappointed team here. The Marlboro team. Back to you, Charlie. Tippers are flaring in the Fittipaldi pit, but there is good news in the Danny Sullivan pit. He is well on his way back from that broken arm. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, Charlie, here's a... Here now the Budweiser checkered flag as we will take a look at the final standings and Johnny Rutherford, uh, your analysis of the race today. Well, I, I think Michael Andretti just finally out uh, did the odds. He had a chance to, uh, to pull off a victory today without any problems. It was very close with Emerson on the backstretch there. But uh, it's good to see somebody else in victory lane. I, Emerson does an extremely good job, and they have a, they've been on a roll. Danny Sullivan, of course, he's back. Teo Fabi is uh, doing his familiar consistency. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's just been an ex excellent race today for Toronto. And here are the championship point standings. Emerson Fittipaldi still comfortably out in front of Rick Mears. Gary Gerald has called it the season of the bump and run. Well, early today it was the big bump, Mario Andretti. And Mario was all right. Then late in the race, it was the little bump. Emerson finished second, and Michael took the checkered flag. Bobby Rahal out with engine problems. And little Al, well, he ran out of fuel. Sandy Andretti said it all. We win. This NBC Sports special presentation of the Toronto Indy has been brought to you by Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. By Valvoline Motor Oil. People who know use Valvoline. By AC Delco. Automotive parts that don't just fit, they match. And by Burger King, where we do it like you do it. For Sally Larmick, Gary Gerald, Johnny Rutherford, I'm Charlie Jones. So long from Toronto, and now stay tuned for the U.S. Gymnastics Championships. The individual titles are at stake next on NBC Sports World.